Welcome, Jonathan Co. We agreed on uh, uh, me calling you Jonathan. I'm Galinda. Um, yes. I'll so, try to pronounce uh, it properly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> before I introduce you any further, um, very simple question to start with. Need I ask which Billy Wilder movie you most recently watched, uh, The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes or Fedora? Which one out of those two? Yeah. Or another um, one. <laughs> I actually watched uh, Ace in the Hole uh, last yeah. week um, yeah. because that that amazing uh, film that uh, that kind of satire, early satire on tabloid journalism, uh, is coming up for its seventieth birthday. Uh, it was released in nineteen fifty one, and uh, I've just written a piece about it for the New Statesman here in the UK. So I rewatched uh, Ace in the Hole out of, out of Sherlock Holmes and Fedora, probably Fedora because I watched it. Uh, many, many times, as you can imagine, to write uh, Mr. Wilder and me. Yeah. And uh, The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes I've seen so often now that uh, actually in these days I only watch it about once every five years or so. That's, uh, that's enough to satisfy my obsession. <laughs> you don't need to watch it anymore. You can dream it. Yes, more or less. More yeah. Or less. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So um, you're uh, very well known for uh, the Ross club what a carve up um most recently middle england you wrote it before uh, mr wilder and me um and also uh, i found you uh, um i have written bi biographies on uh, hollywood actors james stewart uh, humphrey bogart in the 90s uh, and bs johnson british writer i uh, to be honest i didn't know him uh, like a fiery mm -hmm. elephant yeah um, um and now billy wilder um uh, let me start by saying thank you for this book because um, uh, uh, it, it, it took me hours and hours and hours to read because uh, at the beginning I started looking things up. Um, uh, I, I had to discover is what's the fiction in your book? I didn't quite know, so I started to watch films and I thought, well, this is this is not going to work this way. It will take me weeks <laughs> to finish it. <laughs> Um, so well, I, I, I decided well, first really read your book and then... Uh, this is really why I yeah. wrote it, to send people back to Wilder's films. That's the, uh, you know, if that's the effect that it has, then uh, then my, my work here is done in a way. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I, I, I didn't watch all his films, but uh, six of them. So um, okay. my six? fee is going directly to a DVD. <laughs> Which six did you, uh, did you watch? Uh, the Lost Weekend. Um, the Apartments, Some Like It Hot, Double Indemnity, Sunset Boulevard, and the sixth one I forgot right now. Okay. Perhaps it was five, I don't know, but yeah, yeah. Uh, all, all in all. And of course, Fedora, yeah, that's the sixth one. Right. <laughs> of um, course, I almost forgot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, as one might expect, you're naming uh, his most famous films, which tend to be his earlier films. I mean, the, the apartment was a kind of turning point for Wilder because it was it was a high point in terms of his uh, achievement. You know, it was a huge critical success, a huge box office success. And he became the first individual to collect the three major Oscars uh, for, for writing, direction, and, and as the producer of the film. Uh, and yet, um, you know, there's this famous story that the, the playwright Moss Hart, who presented him with one of the Oscars, whispered in his ear while he was uh, giving him the award and said, now is the time to stop, Billy. Quit while you're ahead. <laughs> and, uh, and Wilder, of course, said, no, that's the last thing I'm, I'm going to do uh, at this point. Uh, but in a way, he was right, because Wilder never really hit those heights again. And, uh, and yet, the films of his that I revisit again and again are actually the ones that come after that uh, yeah. because because my my real uh, passion as as you can probably tell from the novel is is for the later Billy Wilder for the films that people don't remember so well uh, and which didn't find such a big audience at the time yeah why why is that why, hmm. why is that do you why do you, that? that's a uh, lot of soul searching I think <laughs> uh, yeah I, I suppose so I mean the first film of his that I saw was The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes. And um, I saw it on TV in the UK. Uh, 
1975, the very same broadcast, I think, that, uh, that the British actor and writer uh, Mark Gattis wrote and that had uh, saw, and that had an equally profound effect on him because he then went on to direct and create the, the, the TV show Sherlock, which is very much indebted to, uh, to Wilder's version of Sherlock Holmes. And Mark Gattis has frequently gone on record as saying what a huge inspiration uh, Wilder's film was to that particular show. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I watched it because, not because I was a Billy Wilder fan, I'd never heard of Billy Wilder, but because I was a Sherlock Holmes fan. And uh, reading the Sherlock Holmes stories with my grandfather was one of the great uh, pleasures of my life at that time. And uh, we watched it together, and my grandfather was very uh, dismissive of the film, a little bit angry. I think he, th he thought that Robert Stevens' performance was nothing like uh, his image of Sherlock Holmes, obviously nothing like the Basil Rathbone performance of Sherlock Holmes. Um, he thought that there was uh, too many jokes. He didn't like the kind of homosexual undercurrent between Dr. Watson and Sherlock Holmes. And um, yet all of these things were aspects of the film that absolutely fascinated me. And, um, you know, I, as I've often said, I, I left that screening, uh, having entered it as a Sherlock Holmes fan, I left it as a Billy Wilder fan. And, uh, and from then on, uh, for the rest of the 70s and early 80s, I tried to see as many of his films as I could, which was not fantastically easy at the time. You know, we, we forget in the current age where practically any classic film is available to us at the click of a button, uh, that you, you know, you're only, unless you lived next to a good uh, art house cinema or repertory cinema, which I didn't, then... Um, you know, your only option was to sit around and wait for these films to, to show up on television. So, yeah. uh, you know, I, I, I saw maybe two or three Billy Wilder films a year, if I, if I was lucky from that point on. Yeah, yeah. So perhaps that's even better to 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 get obsessed. The fact that it, it's so hard to get your hands on, on, on a film or on the music, uh, uh, like, like I, I, I read about uh, about your obsession. Music was something as well for you. Well, it, it was really the music uh, in the private life of Sherlock Holmes that uh, that, that grabbed my attention. Uh, first of all, you have a very beautiful, very creative use of the famous uh, theme from Swan Lake by Tchaikovsky, but but also you have the main uh, love theme of the of the the original score, which is an adaptation by Miklos Rocha of his own uh, violin concerto and the slow movement and. I was just getting into classical music at the time, I, I suppose, in my, in my mid-teens, and I heard this piece of music and I thought, wow, that's, that's absolutely fantastic. Uh, and, you know, for, after that first screening, I think it was another three years before I saw the film again, and I didn't really remember much about this, the story or the dialogues, but I remembered the, the score. I remembered the main theme very, very uh, vividly and learned how to play it on the piano by ear and that kind of thing. Uh, so uh the, the the musical element even then was was extremely important and that in a way is why i yeah. decided to make uh, callista in the in the novel my my protagonist uh a film composer yeah it, uh, of course she's the film uh, she's a film musician she becomes one uh, in your novel and it's 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 is it like an uh, to honor miklos rocha the uh, who made, who wrote lots of music for Billy Wilder's films? Is it is it like that, perhaps? Uh, partly that. I certainly wanted Rocha to be a to be a character in the novel, and uh, you know he has quite a big walk on part in the in the third section of the book, the German section of the book. Um, but also, uh, you know, even though, I mean, all the characters in my novels, all the main characters in my novels, without exception, and I've written thirteen now, I think. Uh, are versions of myself, and even though uh, Callista is a is a twenty year old woman in in uh, most of the novel, uh, she's older than that in the present day framing narrative. But even though for most of the story she's a twenty year old woman, she's she's very uh, close to me, and uh, her tastes in music, which are described in the book, are the same as mine. And her, uh, you know, her her kind of enthusiastic amateur approach to music making is the same as mine as well. Um, she's not a classically trained musician or anything like that, but she loves to write uh, music and she has a knack for writing music. So uh, she's she's close to me in that respect. 
Yeah. So if 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 it's okay for you, let's let's go back to the beginning uh, because I'm very intrigued. Why, um, since you are so um, uh, so obsessed with uh, the Sherlock Holmes uh, movie uh, by Billy Wilder, why why write a book about him now at this stage in your life and at this point? What happened uh, at this stage in my life? Um, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I've been uh, wanting to write a book about Billy Wilder for ever since the 70s, so for, for 40 years or so. And for about the last 10 years, I guess, I decided that it was going to be a novel and not, uh, not an essay or not a biography. I mean, there are already lots of good books about Billy Wilder. Uh, I didn't uh, see that there was any need for another biography or, or even another book of essays about him or anything like that. Uh, and you mentioned earlier that I'd written uh, some time ago uh, a biography of a writer, a very little known writer called B.S. Johnson, experimental writer from Britain in the 1960s. And um, that was a very important book for me to write, a very difficult book for me to write. It took, took seven or eight years to complete. And uh, eventually uh, it left me dissatisfied uh, in a way, I felt I'd done the best I could with the, with the form I was using, but it left me dissatisfied with biography as a form. Mm -hmm. uh, I felt that somehow uh, I'd fallen short of telling the whole truth, the deepest truth about B.S. Johnson. And it uh, would have been to write a novel about him. So I thought, well, the next time I write about someone who I'm kind of obsessed with and want to get to the bottom of, then I, I should do it as a novel and not, not as a biography. Uh, and then really it was just a question of uh, waiting for the right. I thought about starting this book in 2015, five years ago, uh, but then Middle England kind of intervened. Brexit happened. Um, the characters from the Rosses Club and the Close Circle, who I revisit in that book, came popped back into my head and sort of demanded to be written about. So, so I had to clear the decks and write that. And then uh, by the time I'd finished writing Middle England, which is a kind of, a kind of big state of the nation, uh, where we are today kind of novel, uh, I just felt I was ready to do something completely different. Uh, I didn't want to write about politics. I didn't want to write about the situation in the UK or the situation in Europe. I didn't want to write about the pandemic. So uh, I thought, well, now, now is the moment to write my Billy Wilder book uh, and kind of slide it in between, uh, you know, maybe my more typical projects. Yeah. So I, I find it really interesting. Um, you, you, you say um, uh, after, after writing the B.S. Johnson biography, there was something. What, what, what was it that you, that you thought? Uh, it, I'd rather had written a novel. What, what, what was it? Um, I mean, even in a novel, uh, a, a kind of historical novel or a non-fiction novel, whatever you want to call Mr. Wilder and me, uh, then I feel you should stick to the historical facts as much as you can. And I, I don't think there's anything really, certainly nothing important in this book that couldn't have happened. Uh, to Billy Wilder or around Billy Wilder at the time I'm writing about, although there is, of course, a lot of invention. But I haven't played uh, fast and loose with the historical truth. I've, I've tried to stick to that as much as I can. So in a way, it's not so different from writing uh, biography. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the end, when I finished my book about B.S. Johnson, I decided to subtitle it The Story of B.S. Johnson because I, I, I felt that I wanted the best way for readers to understand it was as a piece of storytelling, not necessarily as a, a definitive or authorized or, uh, you know, the last word on B.S. Johnson, because I, I don't think such a thing is possible. Every, mm -hmm. uh, every approach you take to the figure that you're writing about is going to be extremely personal and extremely subjective. That's true here more than ever. This is my take on Billy Wilder and uh, other people who 
know him, who love his films, who know more about him than I do, will have different takes and, and might take issue with some of the ways I've portrayed him in this book. But uh, I felt that I could do all of that more honestly and with more freedom, more imaginative freedom by fictionalizing him rather than uh, writing a straight non-fiction book. Yeah, so this, then we have this, I think, very exciting combination of uh, biography and, uh, and, and Callista's story, which you, you made up, but it's uh, perhaps a little bit like yourself. Mm. Um, uh, because she's a, a, a musician. Um, um, I think I, I mentioned exciting because um, um, uh, while reading, I was constantly thinking what's a fact, what's not. Well, I, I will never know, uh, I guess. Um, that's, that's, that's the fun part of, in it. Um, but it's about, it's about a fedora as the centerpiece the penultimate uh, uh, film by Billy Wilder, why not? And then we stopped talking about Sherlock Holmes, mm. but wh why Fedora? <laughs> why not your obsession? Um, well, uh, there is, I mean, pe people find it hard to believe me when I tell them this, but there is already a novel about the making of, of the private life of Sherlock Holmes, uh, a British novel by Patrick Kincaid called The Continuity Girl. Okay which is set against the backdrop of the shooting of, uh, of the film in Scotland. And uh, I know Patrick a little bit and, and didn't want to tread on his toes and also felt that, uh, you know, one novel about the making of this film was, was probably enough. Uh, so that was one, that was one reason. Um, but also, you know, there is, a, there is a story to be told around the making of The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes. It was a huge budget film for its time uh i read i read an essay about wilder recently which which said that you know in in a way you can think of it as his heaven's gate because he he splashed money on this film built the most incredible sets took the most incredible uh care over it shot it spent a year on the shooting and uh and then it flopped uh terribly the the, the producers didn't like it when they saw it they made him cut it down first by half an hour then by a full hour so it came down from a three-hour film to a two-hour film uh, those deleted scenes in their original form are now lost and will never, I don't think, be found again. Um, so I could have told that story. But then whenever I read biographies of Wilder and interviews with Wilder, I'm, I'm more drawn, even though, I, even though I prefer Sherlock Holmes to Fedora as a film, I'm more drawn to the story around the making of Fedora because uh, it's, it's the film that brought Wilder back to Europe uh, and which made him realize kind of unambiguously that his time as the King of Hollywood was over because the film uh, couldn't get finance from a, from a Hollywood studio. And that was a, you know, for someone who picked up those three Oscars 15 years earlier, that was a, that was a big humiliation and a big uh, wake up call really. And I wanted to write about that moment, what, what that moment meant to Wilder personally uh, what it told us about uh, the film culture of the 1970s and how that was changing and what it would be like for Wilder, this quintessential European born in, uh, born in Poland, brought up in Vienna and Berlin and Paris to come back to those places uh, kind of with his tail between his legs, really, uh, yeah. not, 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 not of his own, not really of his own volition, but still feeling very much uh, at home as a quintessential European filmmaker, which is how I now yeah. think of him. Yeah, yeah, a, a kind of almost over the hill director, which must have been very painful uh, for him to, to witness, right? Uh, like uh, you mentioned. Yeah, ter terribly painful. And, yeah. uh, you know, we, we'll, we'll all get there eventually. I mean, it's, it's, it happens to the, the book business is not quite as brutal as the film business or the music business, but it does, uh, does catch up with us all. I'm, I'm, turning 60 in a couple of months while there was 70 when he made Fedora. So, uh, you know, what, what happened to him is always a kind of a bit of a, a bit of a shadow looming on my horizon as well. So that's why you decided I write it now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Confront the demon. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> to be ahead of it. <laughs> so Fedora is, um, um, it's a story about an actress uh, in the same place as Billy Wilder, in a, in, a, in a way, also over the hill. Um, yeah. 
it's the, the, the it's in it's also that that's intriguing because it's it doubles uh, his story and um do, do you think that's what draw, drew do him to to this book to 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 make a film out of it well i assume so i mean it's 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 hard to see what would have drawn him to it otherwise really because uh in, you know i've read the novella that the film is based on and uh it's very problematic material for a film narrative because it has this big reveal uh which which turns everything you think about the story on its head yeah and uh you know how do you how do you plant that in a three-act screenplay well well wilder and Bill and il diamond planted about just over halfway through the film so so for the first hour of the film you think you're watching one story and then yeah. you're plunged into a series of uh, flashbacks and the, and the yeah. film changes its nature completely yeah and uh i don't think we it, we, we we have to um uh, we don't i don't think we have to tell no. the audience what the book's about right no no, no we don't and that's not uh and I, I think i've managed to write a whole novel about the making of the film without without giving away the the twists so uh, i think even after even after reading mr wilder and me you can you can still see fedora with kind of uh, innocent eyes but um it, it does make it a very awkward film uh narratively and i think the first half of the of the movie works much better than the than the second half um mm -hmm. And but also tonally, it's it's there's something strange about it. Um, you know, a lot of people compare it to Sunset Boulevard because it's like it, because it's about uh, an aging actress who uh, the film business has forgotten. Uh, but the tone of Sunset Boulevard is very uh, assured, uh, even though it's quite a quite a unique and interesting tone, which treads a kind of line between satire and yeah. kind of gothic melodrama and horror and and in a way fedora tries to tread that same line but the the blend curdles somewhere along the way i think and it's it's just not as successful but i even though um you know i, I would never say to people you must watch fedora it's one of billy wilder's greatest films i would i would certainly say you must watch fedora because it's one of his most uh, fascinating films i think yeah. and it is a very personal piece of work and, and maybe reveals more about him than uh than he knew he was doing and, and would have been comfortable with yeah yeah I, I i i would say you have to watch sunset boulevard and fedora in one day because it, it's it, the perfect it, double bill it's the perfect double bill and it's the perfect double bill yeah. also to um um to see the difference it, within a few decades um what, what a filmmaker uh how, how a filmmaker can change right so yeah. boulevard is Kind of perfect uh, in its color, in its tone, in its lighting, and this is, this is, of course, it's 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 very well made, but it's 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 it was outdated, I guess, when it was released in cinemas, uh, and that's yeah. a fascinating thing to see. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, you know, when when you consider that uh, you know we we have the Godfather films. Going back even before that, we'd had Bonnie and Clyde, we'd had Easy Rider, uh, we'd had Soldier Blue, and then the early Scorsese films, Mean Streets and Taxi Driver. I mean, the the, the vocabulary of Hollywood filmmaking had changed so much. And you can see Wilder yeah. in his last films, particularly this in the front page, I think, which came before it. You can see him making a, a sort of token effort to keep up with that, putting a bit of female nudity into the films uh using more swear words and this kind of thing yeah and yet you know that that's just pure cosmetics uh essentially the aesthetic has not changed at all since the since the 40s and 50s when he you know was was at the height of his powers as a as a classical filmmaker and uh yeah it it it, it sits very uneasily in the in the era of uh, of those more more adventurous movies yeah 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 compared compared uh, as you say to the to the other new films of the new directors with beards as you yeah. write in your book the kids with beards which is not my phrase that was uh wilder's uh, co-writers 
phrase, IAL Diamond. And maybe we should talk a little bit about IAL Diamond because he is the third main character. Yes, please. Yes, please. And, yes. Uh, and, you know, one of the things uh, I discovered or realized by reading around and watching around the making of Fedora was that Diamond was not just Wilder's co screenwriter, he was his, he was his rock. He was his professional support. He was his emotional support. Uh, they saw each other every day. They sat together in their office in LA every day for seven or eight hours at a time. You know, they they literally knew each other better than they knew their own wives, I think, and, yeah. and in a way had a closer bond than they did with, with their own wives. Yeah. And uh, so many of Wilder's films, I'm thinking of Double Indemnity, thinking of Some Like It Hot, uh, thinking of the front page, you know, they're, they're, they're about male friendships and male relationships and, and, and the love between two men, really. Yeah. And uh, not, in, not in a sexual way, but, but, but in a deep emotional way. And, um, you know, that is reflected in real life in his relationship with I.L. Diamond. So I, I found that a very uh, poignant relationship and a very interesting relationship to, to try and write about and examine. Yeah, and also I found it, it, it felt like um, um, it gave me kind of a nostalgic feeling reading about uh, their relationships uh, for, also for decades uh, with lo lots of love. Um, um, and, and indeed in your book, he's, uh, he's his, his work. Um, yeah. Let, let's talk a little bit in, in, in that sense about nostalgia because um, that's what what your book's about that's what uh while some of wilder's films are, are about not sense of boulevard and fedora um could, could you elaborate a little bit for us on on on, on that topic uh well I, you know i i suppose both sunset boulevard and fedora are classic narratives about the danger of allowing yourself to be trapped in the past and and just not to move with the times where whether you end up like uh, like Norma Desmond, marooned in your mansion on Sunset Boulevard, never seeing the daylight, or uh, equally you end up uh, like Fedora, marooned on her Greek island and and uh, never able to get out. And uh, both of them are prisoners of their past. There's a very beautiful song by the, the band Prefab Sprout called Prisoner of the Past, and I always think of that song when I think about Sunset Boulevard uh, and Fedora. And, and Wilder, of course, was very alert to the dangers of that, and he did not want to be a prisoner of his past. He didn't. Yeah. He gave a very um, uh, passionate and embittered interview around about this time, where where he said to the interviewer who came and saw him, you know, what he was kind of striding energetically around the room and and saying to the interview, "What did you expect to see? Did you expect to see some sad old man clutching his old Oscars and reflecting on his past glories?" because that is exactly the kind of thing he didn't want to be. He wanted, he was a creative artist and he wanted to go on, uh, you know, making films until he died. A bit like Woody Allen does now, still still making, you know, one film a year, whether people see them or not. <laughs> and um, and that that was what Wilder wanted really, but, but of course he also worked uh, in, a, in a very ruthless uh, commercial industry and yeah. a film is not like a novel. You can't just sit in your study and write it you need you need money to make yeah. it and yeah. and by the time he made fedora it was clear that that money was uh, was drying up yeah that's what that's that's all also what i felt i, I know the film industry can be very cruel it's very cruel. it's very hard um mm. uh, even for the best of of the directors uh, yeah but but, cinema. but you know wilder uh embraced that and uh he he wasn't interested I mean, he was an artist. He was a serious artist and a very great artist, I think. But he was also fully uh, immersed in the commercial realities of of Hollywood and and had great respect for the for the commercial realities of the film industry. Yeah. Um, you know, as uh, it, he has said in interviews, and I have him saying in the novel. Um, you know, we don't sit around in the morning reading Caillou Cinema and Positif and sight and sound, we, we read the trades, we read Variety and we read The Hollywood Reporter because that's where you find out what's really happening uh, in the film business. It's all about deals and it's all about money. 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, until, until he died, I think he regarded films like The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes uh, and Avanti, two of my favorite late Billy Wilder films, as flops and disasters, not because they were aesthetic failures. I, I don't even think he even had an opinion about that, but, but because they were commercial failures. Commercial, yeah. And, uh, and you know, for him, that was, uh, the public's verdict was, was more important than the, than the critical verdict because you don't, uh, you know, you don't raise the money for your next film because you've had a, a fantastic two-page review in Cahiers du Cinema. Yeah, well, that's the difference between Hollywood and art cinema, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah. So we have to talk about the sudden change of form in the novel. And I think oh, yeah. I was <laughs> right. Um, halfway through the book, suddenly the novel becomes a script. Yeah. As Billy Wilder doing, uh, come together with uh, um, uh, some uh, German producers, um, uh, tells about his, his life story, uh, mm -hmm. or at least part of it. And you decided it had to be a script. Yeah. Um, please tell us why. Because it's quite well, a long script. Yeah, um, I suppose I made some creative choices which uh, came up against each other and contradicted each other and, and painted me into a into a corner in a way. Uh, I mean, there will there will there may be a very few, very small number of my readers who will realise that Mr. Wilder and me is is not a completely self-contained novel. It contains characters from two of my earlier books. Uh, the Rain Before It Falls and Expo 58. And these characters will reappear in, in subsequent books. So, so although the, obviously the main focus of the book is on uh, Billy Wilder, it's also uh, a volume in a sequence. And it's the middle volume in the sequence. And uh, I always uh, wanted it. I always knew that the one thing that it had to contain was the story of Wilder's experiences in uh, Nazi Germany and uh, Britain and Germany in 1945, immediately after the Second World War. And, uh, you know, the, the journey into his, the story of his, uh, what happened to his family, how he lost his mother in the, in the death camps and so on. Uh, so whatever else, even before I knew it was going to be a book about the making of Fedora, I knew that, that was going to be the heart of the book, the kind of dark heart of the book. Um, okay, so that was one uh, creative choice. And then I made another creative choice, which was to narrate the book in the voice of Callista. Because when I started telling people I'm writing a book about uh, Billy Wilder, I, I became alarmed by how many people, particularly young people, just said, who? And, you know, I realized that, uh, okay, I'm a man in his late 50s who loves movies. Of course, I know who Billy Wilder is, but a lot of uh, younger people, a lot of people who are not so interested in films, uh, they know his name vague, vaguely maybe, but they don't necessarily know who he is or much about him. So I thought, right, I'm going to have to use a narrator who can take these readers by the hand and kind of guide them through. So I wanted a narrator like Callista, who knows nothing about Wilder when she meets him. She's yeah. a complete uh, naive. She's never heard of him. She's never heard of his films or seen any of his films. She's plunged right in at the deep end. Um, and then that gave me this problem when we get to the story of his wartime experiences. Well, how can Callista narrate that? She can't because she's 20 years old. She was born in the 50s. Uh, she doesn't know anything about Billy Wilder. This yeah. part of the book can't be told in her voice. Uh, so I thought, well, it has to be told in Wilder's voice. That will make it more personal anyway and more, uh, more powerful, I hope. So I tried writing it as a monologue at the dinner table where he's putting this young German guy straight on, on what happened uh, during the Holocaust. Uh, didn't work, it was too heavy. Uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't tell the story that way. And then, and then I realized uh, to my surprise actually that, that Wilder published almost nothing from the mid thirties onwards, he wrote nothing that wasn't a screenplay. Uh, he wrote a lot of journalism in the 20s and early 30s, which has just been republished, incidentally. Uh, and 
Um, then he stopped and he started writing screenplays and that's all he wrote from then on. There are no articles, there are no lectures, gave a lot of interviews, but, but he didn't put pen to paper in any other form. Yeah, yeah. So I thought, well, if, it, if it's going to be in his voice, then it has to be a screenplay because that was how he expressed himself yeah. from then on. And uh, so it was a bit like, uh, I don't know if you know, but at the end of the Rotters Club, uh, there's a sentence that goes on for 30 pages and there was, there was never any plan to write this enormous sentence. I just started writing it and literally thought to myself, how long can I keep this up? And uh, wrote, <laughs> wrote two pages and wrote five pages and then wrote 10 pages and then it was 30 pages and that it was, it was an improvisation. And it was the same with this. I just thought, well, I'll try writing it as a script. Maybe I'll get a couple of scenes yeah. out of it. Maybe I'll get five pages out of it, 10 pages. And then it went on for 60 pages and it's, it seemed to work so uh, so yeah. off it. Um, oh, and well. I, I assumed that a lot of I assumed that my editor would want me to take it out. I assumed that readers would say, "Well, I liked your book, but not that film script bit." <laughs> but uh, but no, people people seem to like it. In some yeah. many cases, it's their favorite part of the book. So yeah. maybe I, I would, liked maybe I, I liked it the as whole well. book that way. I liked it as well, but I had to look it up. I, I wanted to know how, how long is he going to keep it up? <laughs> mm. <laughs> but yeah. actually, you know, it it. I think it takes the, the drama out of, out of as, you, as you call it, a very dark heart of the book. And at the same time, it, it deeply moves me. But I can continue after that with uh, having interest in Fedora. So that's why I think it works quite well. Mm. So, but it's, but I, I love this mixing kind of, uh, I love this mixing of forms. So that, that was my, thing with it um well it helps that wilder himself used uh, voiceover a lot in his movies uh, you know the people who who don't like wilder's films one of the things they often criticize yeah. about them is there's too much narration yeah uh I, almost any billy wilder film double indemnity sunset boulevard the apartment private life of Sherlock Holmes, they all begin begin with voiceover narration so he actually wrote quite literary yeah. screenplays in that way so uh, yeah. I felt I could write a, a lot that was, in fact, a monologue in Wilder's own voice, uh, but st still do that within the, the kind of framework of a Wilder-esque screenplay, because that's kind of how he would have done it, although I, I take it yeah. a little further. He would have loved it. So would you mind reading some, a, a small part of, of the book for us? Ah, OK. Um, I think it's a good moment for, for okay. that. So uh, this, is, this is a passage about, it's a very short passage about um, humour and seriousness, which is the great combination that, that Wilder was a master of. And it's his co-screenwriter, I.L. Diamond, talking to Callista on a beach in Greece while they're shooting Fedora and uh, telling her a story about uh, Wilder and, and the ballet dancer, Nijinsky. You don't know the story of Nijinsky, he said. He was a great dancer, but he went nuts. He ended up in a mental asylum, suffering from terrible delusions. There's a funny story about that as well. This seemed unlikely, but Mr. Diamond was determined to tell it anyway. Billy was in a meeting once with a producer, and he was telling him that he wanted to make a film about Nijinsky. So he told the producer the whole story of Nijinsky's life, and this guy was looking at him in horror and saying, are you serious? You want to make a movie? about a Ukrainian ballet dancer who ends up going crazy and spending 30 years in a mental hospital thinking that he's a horse. And Billy says, ah, but in our version of the story, we give it a happy ending. He ends up winning the Kentucky Derby. And this time, says Callista, I did laugh, partly because I thought the story was funny and partly because I liked the way Mr. Diamond told it, the way his eyes shone as he reached the punchline, the way that for him, briefly, the telling of this joke brought an instant of strange joy and clarity to the world. And I realized that for a man like him, a man who was essentially melancholy, a man for whom the ways of the world could only ever be a source of regret and disappointment, humor was not just a beautiful thing, but a necessary thing. That the telling of a good joke would bring a moment, transient but lovely, when life made a rare kind of sense and he would no longer, and would no longer seem random and chaotic and unknowable. It made me glad to think that in the midst of the world's many intractabilities, he still had this one source of consolation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Beautiful. <laughs>
of course. <laughs> well, um, uh, you know, it, it's it's a kind of uh, cliche that 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 uh, humorous writers are are melancholy people, and like uh, so many cliches, it starts out from a grain of truth, and it was it was certainly true of uh, of Diamond, I think. Who was a who was a very serious man, a very shy man, uh, a very quiet man, but also uh, was very uneasy throughout the writing and shooting of Fedora because it wasn't a funny film, and he and Wilder had only made funny films up until that point. They'd only made comedies, and he yeah. kept he kept trying to uh, get Wilder to put more jokes in the script, put more funny situations in the script. You know, I think I think because he had a melancholic, deep-rooted sense that that would actually make the film more serious in a way, yeah, and, uh, and bring more bring more light to it, and and therefore make the shade of the film easier to uh, to get into and to and to understand. Yeah. And uh, you know, I have a I have a lot of sympathy with that point yeah. of view. I mean, I, I wrote a very serious novel once called The Rain Before It Falls, and when when I look back on that book now uh there are no jokes in this at all and there should be one or two at least uh i kind of i was a bit unfaithful to myself by doing that i think perhaps it's a little bit younger a little bit yeah, more serious yeah, yeah maybe maybe <laughs> actually I, I i found out at fedora um it's just something i think think of in, in between my questions um that fedora was uh, uh uh had a new screening a few years ago or perhaps Two years ago at the Cannes Film Festival, so it yeah, that's it, right. It, yeah. it it kind of found found its place in the end in uh, um, in in cinema in the whole scheme of uh, of the, of the classics. So that's it. It has been restored. I think it, uh, I think it is being rehabilitated a bit. I mean, yeah. uh, ten years ago, it was actually very hard to get a copy. I, I bought my copy from on DVD from Spain, and it had. Spanish subtitles, which you had to turn off. The print wasn't very, wasn't very good. Yeah. Uh, and uh, now there's, you know, there are there are DVDs, there are Blu-rays. It's been restored. It it pops up at festivals. Yeah. And again, I think I think people are beginning to realise that it's uh, a very interesting film. And and I'm amazed by the number of people who know about Wilder who don't actually know that it exists at all, and yeah. are, and are astonished when you tell them about it. Yeah. Well, I didn't know of it as well. And I think also young people don't have the feeling of the film being outdated because they 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 don't know quite well what a film of 1978 ha has to look like. It, 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 yeah. it isn't that important anymore. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So that's that, that's that's the funny thing. One more question before we go to the, I have lots, but one more question. Um, Callista has her own love story with Matthew uh, when she's young, uh, uh, on set, uh, well, not on set, but uh, while shooting, while Billy Wilder shooting Fedora in uh, Greece. Um, and uh, Matthew tells her um, about um, what the arts should look like, that mm. it should be like uh, a mirror with no, uh, with, uh, with no uh, decoration, simple, uh, crystal clear. And uh, he sounds like me. Uh, for, to me, he sounds like. And you mentioned it, I think, like one of the the, the bearded uh, directors. Yeah. And he says that uh, um, Wilder uh, makes films with too much decoration, with huge golden frames, and uh, so intense that you cannot see the real image. Yeah. Yeah. I found it wonderful that you wrote it, and I think you don't agree with Matthew at all. No, but I was probably saying the same things myself uh, in my in my early twenties. In fact, I'm yeah. sure I was. Uh, you know, everybody uh, goes through this iconic. Well, most people go through this iconoclastic phase, and uh, you know this metaphor that he comes out with about the mirror and how the the frame should be very simple so that it doesn't distract from the image uh, is a kind of facile easy way that somebody in, in those circumstances would uh, would would put it. But in a way, I wrote that passage to make Callista herself seem more interesting, because what interested me about Callista is that she's she's kind of born old fashioned. Yeah. And, uh, you know, even though she's in her early 20s and she's born into this exciting era of movie making when she goes on her first uh, 
when she goes on her first date with, uh, with Matthew in Paris, it's, uh, they go for a double bill and he chooses taxi driver and she chooses the shop around the corner by, by Lubitsch. And, uh, you know, she, she finds the, the, the kind of uh, the brutality and the darkness of the Scorsese movie almost impossible to, to deal with. And, and she loves this, what he considers to be a, a, a very kind of twee and old fashioned uh, rom-com from, from the 1940s. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of like her for that reason, because I, I find it interesting that she's, uh, she has such old fashioned tastes so young. And of course, it's, it's why she and, and Billy Wilder in the end uh, get on so well, because, uh, you know, even though he's 70 and she's 20, uh, yeah. they're, they're, they're in a strange kind of way. They're from the same era. They have, they have, the, same, they have the same filmic tastes, at least. Yeah, I like that about her as well. I, I connected with her in that in that sense, you know. When you you can be old fashioned when you're young, but when you're uh, in your fifties, I I I notice uh, I, I, me myself. I'm starting to tell people. Well, I I thought of that when I was twenty as well. It's not it's not only your your age. So, so I think that's yeah. that's the thing about Callista. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we have to go. Well, we don't have to, but. Uh, I noticed some remarks in the chat and we have some questions, but um, one, one uh, which popped up uh, just now was uh, less isn't always more when we talked about Matthew's remark. Uh, would you mind uh, saying something about that? Um, less isn't always more. Um, well, I, I guess, uh, you know, that would, that would be uh, Wilder's rejoinder to, to, to Matthew's uh, criticism, if uh, if if he ever heard it, yeah. that um, and in fact he he kind of says this something like this to Callista at the end of the at the end of the novel that um, you know you have to you can look beyond the what might seem to be the old fashioned conventions of uh, of classical filmmaking uh, and see. The kind of the kind of pain and the kind of depth of experience actually that lies behind uh, a film uh, like *The Shop Around the Corner*. I mean, mm -hmm. yes, it is a it is a kind of delicate, bittersweet, romantic comedy, but it's it's it also has a suicide attempt in it, and it's a it's a it's a story about a you know a, a man who has reached the end of his tether, and it's also a story about a group of characters who are struggling to make ends meet in difficult economic circumstances but but Lubitsch doesn't push that at you um, mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of other lighter more delightful things to enjoy in the film and uh, you know in that same passage Wilder tells one of uh, my favorite stories which I, I read in an interview of his about this this German businessman who's had a terrible day at the office and comes home and uh, he, he has faces a huge tax bill. Um, his daughter is pregnant, his, his son is in trouble with the police. His wife has left him, everything in his life is going ter terribly. And then his neighbor comes around and say, let's go around, let's go to the cinema. I hear they're showing Despair by Rainer Werner Ver Fassbinder. And, um, he, you know, Wilder, um, Wilder knows that uh, what a, it's not enough for a film just to throw the the ugliness and the darkness of the world in your face. You have to show a, a, a bigger picture than that. Partly, partly because it's you have a duty to entertain the audience, but also because you make more truthful films that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one. Let's let's do another question. Let's let's do the first question. Uh, okay. Um, how long did it take you to write your first draft? Um, the truth is, I don't really. Different writers work in different ways. I don't really do drafts. I revive. I revise very carefully as I go along. Uh, yeah. So I so I write quite slowly, particularly to start with. But I, I'm temperamentally incapable of starting a novel until I've 
got the whole thing in my head anyway. So I, so I know how it will end. I know what the stages on the journey will be on the way there. Um, so I suppose what I'm saying is, is that I don't draft and redraft on paper. I do all that in my head before I start writing. And then what I what yeah. what gets published is is very close to the to the first draft. I mean, each scene will have been written and rewritten and rewritten four or five times. But there's no there are no files on my computer saying Mr. Wilder and me first draft, second draft, third draft, and so on. Okay. It's, a, it's a continuous process. So uh, so how 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 long are you have you been thinking? <laughs> well, I've been thinking about this book for years. Uh, probably yeah, longer, yeah. Pro probably longer than I've ever uh, contemplated a book and, and turned it over in my head before. So the the writing of it uh, was fairly quick by my standards. Um, I began in uh, October 2019, and then I finished it during the first uh, lockdown in the UK, uh, March, April, May. So the the whole process, the actual writing process probably took about eight or nine months, but that was the culmination of, of years of thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Another question. Uh, can you read and enjoy the book without knowing the films? Uh, perhaps that's a difficult question for you to answer, but uh, I think you can, but uh, well, I, I, <laughs> what, I is, what do you I, think? I hope so. Um, I mean, I, I do have a uh, a slightly self-destructive tendency to go towards, to gravitate towards obscure subjects. So, you know, I wrote a biography of B.S. Johnson, a writer that nobody has ever heard of. Uh, I've written uh, a novel about the making of Fedora, the one Billy Wilder film that hardly anybody has seen. <laughs> um, so one of the things I think about when I embark on these projects is, uh, you know, do I just want this to be a book, a niche book for aficionados of this writer or this film, or do I want to try and find a wider audience and I always want to find a wider audience so I've tried in Mr Wilder and Me to find a way of writing it uh, through the the eyes of Callista which means that anyone who hasn't seen many Wilder films or maybe is not even very interested in Billy Wilder will uh, find a way into it. I'm, su I'm sure they they will just they have just to try it. Yeah. Another question yeah. I wonder how the Greek readers react on Callista <laughs> preferring brie, French cuisine above Greek feta, <laughs> Greek cuisine in general. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, to be honest, I, I didn't uh, <laughs> didn't really anticipate that criticism when I uh, when I uh, created Callista. I always knew there was going to be this big uh, scene at the end of the book where Mr. Wilder and Callista ate brie together because. Uh, it didn't happen with her, obviously, because she's fictional, but he did arrive late on set for the shooting of the final scene of the film because he detoured to these farms in the uh, in the Mo area outside Paris to taste the wonderful cheese that they produce there. And the, uh, the, the associate producer of the film who tells this, the story of that evening very beautifully in Robert Fisher's uh, documentary about the making of Fedora um, it, it really made it sound to me like a beautiful story, so I, so I, so I had to do that. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, to be truthful, wild about brie myself. I like, I like brie, but it, but it, but it had to be that cheese because that was the, that was the true story. Uh, yeah. I like feta as well, so that, <laughs> um, that's my attempt at a diplomatic answer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, more questions. I will go to the chat now. Let's see. Um... Ah, this one's and I, I don't think we will have time for all of them but i just i just go uh, start on top as an avid film watcher by your own recognition which ones would you recommend for a bit of a rookie 20 something to start this wonderful journey into the topic and thank you of uh, billy wilder films i think he yeah. i think anastasia yeah. means that yeah yeah uh well i wouldn't start with fedora uh even if Hopefully, my novel has piqued your curiosity about the film. Uh, I would start um, with uh, probably The Apartment, because to me, that's the most perfect of Wilder's films in the way it balances light and shade. And from there, you can either go dark into the, into the melodramas like Sunset Boulevard, Double Indemnity, 
uh, the Lost Weekend, um, or you can go light into the comedies like uh, like Sabrina, um, like Love in the Afternoon, Avanti. Um, but I think the apartment would be a good place uh, to start because you really get both sides of Wilder's artistic temperament in that film in a, in a kind of perfect balance. Yeah, so Anastasia, the apartment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Carla asks you, did you have the voice, oh, the voice over narration of the films in mind while writing the beginning of the book? Um, not really. I, I can see uh, I can see what's meant by that question, but the the I had a very uh, specific and very strong visual image in mind, which is uh, unusual for me because my books don't usually start from visual ideas. Uh, maybe that is a function of the fact that I was writing a book about movies, but um, I had a very strong image in my mind of Callista riding up this long escalator at uh, Green Park Station in Piccadilly in central London. Uh, the movement of the escalator, her coming up behind this mother and her little child and the, the hop, skip and the jump of the child as she comes off the escalator. That, that was the beginning of the film, of the, of the, of the novel for me. So um, even though, uh, yeah, it's told in Callista's voice and I can see in a way how it does have the feel of a movie voiceover. Uh, that wasn't the intention. It was. It, it, was, uh, it was. It was a. It was a very meant to be a very visual moment. Yeah, it is with the red jacket of uh, "Don't Look Now" in it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Immediately, I know what what kind of uh, <laughs> book it will be with film <laughs> references. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is an interesting one of uh, by Sam. Uh, what would you think of a film adaptation of Mr. Wilder and Me? Um, well, I hope there's going to be one. We're certainly in uh, in negotiations to uh, to have a film adaptation made. As you know, there's many a slip uh, between the idea and the and the shoot, so it could all go pear shaped. But uh, but hopefully there will be uh, a film adaptation. Um, I'd love to see it. Uh, I mean, I not that many of my books have been adapted. There was a there was a BBC TV series of the Rotters Club, and there was um, a French movie of the terrible privacy of Maxwell Sim. And uh, you know, I, I love it when this happens because you get to see somebody else's uh, take on your material, and you get to see mm -hmm. what somebody else does with it. Would you, would you want to be invo very much involved in it, no, or no, no? I'd rather just, uh, you know, turn up at the turn up at the first screening and 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 see, yeah. see what people have made of it and, and be surprised. Yeah. Um, but uh, I do think Billy Wilder himself is a wonderful role for a, for an actor. So um, I wouldn't I wouldn't like to pitch him with any casting suggestions, but I think that would be a great opportunity for someone. Anthony yeah. Hopkins, maybe. Gary Oldman. Yeah, yeah, that would also be good. But they'd have to be Let's able go to forget. do a good Austrian accent. That's very important. Yeah. Because Wilder yeah. never, never lost his very strong uh, Austrian Yeah, accent. that is too. I would go for Gary Oldman. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with that. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, for me, watching uh, uh, Richard says, Oh, Richard, for me, watching the movie after having read the book, I appreciated the book even more because of the way it echoes the movie. So there's a compliment for you. Uh, yeah, nice compliment. Um, I mean, thinking about it, and I hadn't thought about this before, but, uh, you know, once you've written 12 or, or 13 novels as I have, you can never really do anything new again. And I, I suppose what I do with Fedora in this book is a little bit like what I did with the movie What a Carve Up in the novel What a Carve Up, where the, the plot of the novel kind of turns into the plot of the film and the hero's uh, youthful obsession with the film uh, kind of colors his perception of, uh, of the world forever afterwards and eventually kind of takes over his life. So although the two, although one is a, is a very different 
much more bitter, satirical, comic, larger scale novel. And Mr. Wilder and Me is much more intimate and, and small scale. Uh, there's a, there is actually a strong crossover between the two books and I'd never noticed that before. So I don't know whether I'm happy about that or not. I've just realized that I've repeated myself. Don't think about it anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> something to think about. Well, it's about, it's nine o'clock, but since I talked a little bit longer than I uh, should, one more question. Is that, is that okay for you? One more, yeah, sure. Yeah? Yep. Um, this is uh, by Suzanne. Uh, I did not read Mr. Wilder yet, but I would like to thank Mr. Ko for Middle, in for Middle England. Uh, being a slow, slow reader, it was a comfort to me during pandemic months. The conversations between Doug and the press officer made me laugh out loud. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed writing those conversations. They were they were they were very good fun uh, to do in a, in a book which, in some ways, was a was a kind of slightly difficult and painful book to write because uh, you know the whole Brexit uh, narrative was unfolding in real time, more or less as I wrote it. And, uh, you know, things in my country were going in a, in a direction which I, which I didn't think were particularly healthy or desirable. And I, I still don't think that. So it, it was a difficult book to write in lots of ways. And I was very surprised to be honest by how successful it's been because I didn't really think anyone would want to read a novel about Brexit, particularly outside the UK, uh, mm -hmm. but um, you can never predict uh, which of your books is going to strike a chord and, and which ones one isn't. And often it's the most, the ones that you think are most culturally specific and inward looking and have the least universal appeal, which which turn out to, to break out. Yeah. I mean, What a Carve Up was my first uh, success in other countries and that amazed me because I, I deliberately written it as a book, which as far as I was concerned was only comprehensible to, to British readers really. And, and the same in a way with Middle England. Yeah. But um, you can, you know, you, you can, you can never tell which of your books is going to, is going to work in other countries or, or, or die a death. Yeah. Yeah. So this, this one was a success uh, for, for Suzanne. Good. <laughs> Yep. And I think she's, yeah, she, she, she thanks you for that. <laughs> so um, we have to end, but I want to, want to mention one thing. In a review in a Dutch newspaper on your, uh, on your book, journalists wrote, Mr. Mr. Wilder and me is partly a tribute to happy endings. Uh, the kind of films Billy Wilder wanted to make and Jonathan Coe wrote such a book. So I thought that that's a very nice compliment. Uh, I, uh, I think uh, it will make you happy. Um, um, that's why I wanted to, to share it with you. I want to thank you for, um, for the book and uh, very much so for this interview. I enjoyed it uh, very much. I hope the audience did as well. Um, and I hope we will meet again someday uh, in real life. In uh, real life, perhaps. yes. Well, would, would have been something. <laughs> a beautiful dream at the moment, but, uh, but let's cling to our dreams. Let's, yeah, let's dream like Billy Wilder made us, right? <laughs> Thank so you. thank you very much, Jonathan. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Goodbye.